So the, the real purpose of the CVD Real Registry and the study group uh, was to really understand the real world value of novel treatments for type 2 diabetes and specifically for the study we're presenting here at the ACC of SGLT2 inhibitors. And uh, really the way that uh, the study was put together, um, it, we really thought of how can we uh, do this in the best way possible uh, for a real world evidence type study. And what you really want to do is you want to take a very wide population of patients. Ideally you'd want those patients to come from various countries uh, with uh, different healthcare systems, uh, different prescribing patterns, uh, and uh, you'd want the populations of patients to be as representative uh, as possible within those countries. And then you'd want to match the patients that are being prescribed different treatments one-to-one -one the best way possible so that you really compare apples to apples. That's exactly what we did. We actually took very broad populations of patients with type 2 diabetes in six different countries. Um, in all of these countries, these uh, specific data sets were re generally representative of a diabetic population within that country. In three out of six, these were actually, we studied with the entire populations of patients with diabetes in Scandinavian countries, in Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. Uh, in other three countries, as these registries were highly representative of a general type 2 diabetes population, uh, we ended up with a very large cohort of patients. And then we selected patients newly initiated on SGLT2 inhibitors and compared them with those being initiated on other glucose-lowering treatments, so active comparator, including any other types of glucose-lowering drugs. And we matched them one-to-one -one on as many characteristics as were available to us through this propensity match methodology and ended up with a very robust propensity score uh, that uh, allowed us to match patients uh, the best way possible uh, so that we really compare apples to apples. Absolutely. So uh, what we found uh, was quite fascinating, actually. Uh, the use of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, versus other glucose-lowering drugs was associated with uh, really striking uh, reduction in uh, the risk of hospitalization for heart failure, uh, uh, about a 40% reduction, and nearly 50% reduction in all-cause death. And uh, those results were quite consistent, regardless of any sensitivity analysis that we did, and it was also very consistent across different countries uh, with very little heterogeneity. So, um, in fact, uh, you know, if you look at our data, what we show is that um, uh, different SGLT2 inhibitors uh, were uh, used at, to, to a great extent in different countries. So in the U.S., for example, it was primarily canagliflozin, uh, where in Europe it was primarily dapagliflozin. But again, regardless of the countries that we look at, uh, the results are extremely consistent, both in terms of reduction in heart failure and reduction in all-cause death. And I think what our data clearly suggests is that, number one, the results that were observed in previously published clinical trials appear to be translating into uh, real-world effectiveness. Uh, we're seeing it in real-world clinical practice, uh, that uh, because 87% of our patients did not have cardiovascular disease at baseline, it appears that the results may be applicable to a much broader population of patients with type 2 diabetes. And finally, because we observe those results um, with uh, the entire class, this may well be a class effect and not compound specific. Well, I think there is uh, a little bit of a misconception sometimes where, you know, we, we always think of clinical trials as gold standard of uh, clinical uh, evidence generation. But it's important to remember that uh, clinical trials, like any other studies, have their own set of sets of limitations. And probably the most important one is just by the nature of having inclusion and exclusion criteria in clinical trials, you end up with a, a sliver of patients that may not necessarily uh, be representative of the entire patient population with the condition, and uh, the results therefore may not be generalizable to all the kinds of you know, all kinds of patients that we see in clinical practice. And so, what the clinical trials really show is the efficacy of treatments. But what you really want to do is complement that by looking at real-world effectiveness, and that's where really RWE or real-world evidence studies come. Uh, come from. They uh, demonstrate not just the efficacy but real-world effectiveness of certain interventions. And so the way I would think about it is that RWE or real-world evidence studies are really a great complement to clinical trials. And for the interventions that we use on a daily basis that become a standard of care and which are enshrined in clinical practice guidelines, those are usually based on both types of evidence, clinical trials and real-world evidence data. So I think both are extremely complementary and both are extremely important.
Well, I think one of the main reasons is that SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, while they were developed uh, primarily for treatment of type 2 diabetes and were developed as glucose-lowering compounds, uh, clearly have emerged as compounds that have many other actions that have unique effects on cardiovascular uh, protection and potential on nephro protection as well, uh, some of which already have been described in clinical trials, uh, some of which are under very active investigation. And my suspicion is there are many, other, many possible mechanisms through which that can occur. Uh, those mechanisms are being studied in many mechanistic clinical trials, uh, currently ongoing, and we'll have a, m a lot more information emerging in the coming years. But I think what's already clear is that the uh, beneficial effects of this class of compounds on the cardiovascular system, potentially on the um, on the nephrology side and the renoprotective, nephroprotective effects uh, may well become a lot more important in terms of the profile of these drugs than their glucose-lowering properties. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors may not necessarily be unique in that regard. We have some emerging data with GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, for example, that they may offer, at least some of them may offer, uh, cardioprotective uh, effects as well. But I think the, as, you know, when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitors, it's really the uh, glucose urea that, um, uh, you know, because these drugs are glucose excretors, it's not just the glucose urea that they produce, but also natriuresis and diuretic effect that these drugs have, um, and potential effects on plasma volume reduction uh, that uh, we are starting to see in some of the mechanistic studies. Those hemodynamic properties of the GLT2 inhibitors really differentiate them from uh, all the other drugs that have been developed and are currently being used for management of type 2 diabetes. So I think it's a very exciting group of compounds. It's already a lot that has been done to understand the actions. A lot more needs to be done to better understand how they work. Uh, but I think they're potentially transformative, uh, given the effects that we're seeing on mortality and heart failure. Uh, hospitalizations, they really could be transformative in improving outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes. Well, I think uh, what we're finding now is that, uh, you know, some of our main results, right, are that there appears to be in real-world studies like ours, there appears to be a pretty significant, pretty dramatic association uh, between the use of these compounds as a class and significantly, I would say, markedly lower risk of hospitalization for heart failure and all-cause death as well as a composite of those two outcomes. One of the key questions is why and what are the mechanisms through which these benefits are being delivered. So I think there clearly needs to be a number of additional work that needs to be done to better understand the mechanisms, and lots of those studies are already in progress currently. Second is trying to better understand whether these, uh, this class of compounds can be really effective in treating patients with established heart failure. As you recall in our study, 87% of patients did not have established cardiovascular disease. Uh, one of the main benefits appeared to be reduction in heart failure hospitalization, which by default, because majority, overwhelming majority of patients in our study did not have heart failure at baseline, was probably primarily a heart failure prevention signal rather than a heart failure treatment signal. So understanding what the people with established heart failure can really benefit is very important as well, and trials are currently underway to better understand that. And of course, an an important additional aspect of this should be looking at uh, uh, nephroprotective effect as well. And uh, we are certainly planning to look at that in the CVD real study, and there are clinical trials going on to better understand that as those effects as well. But again, I think combination of uh, mechanistic studies, better understanding of effect in established heart failure, better understanding the nephroprotective effect, all of those things are going to be incredibly important. Well, uh, I think that we should, as a specialty, become much more involved uh, in diabetes management. I think what uh, our study demonstrates uh, and what other studies with SGLT2 inhibitors already have demonstrated uh, is that diabetes is a lot more than a disease of uh, dysglycemia or uh, glucose metabolism. Uh, type 2 diabetes, anyway, is a much more of a complex entity, and it's also a huge risk factor for developing of cardiovascular complications, which is what patients with type 2 diabetes ultimately die from, right? More patients die from cardiovascular complications of diabetes than from any other complications. So if it's a major source of morbidity and mortality in this patient population, then we as cardiologists need to take ownership of managing those complications and make sure that patients are treated with the compounds that are most likely to save lives and improve the quality of life. And now we actually have those compounds uh, available to us that 
you, you know, and the reason for cardiologists to get involved is not for hemoglobin A1C lowering, but really for reducing cardiovascular risk. And I think uh, we are very well positioned as a specialty to do that perhaps better than any other specialty.